Right. Uh, thank you guys. We're gonna get started. Uh, it's a, almost exactly three o'clock, so we can you know get y'all out of here. Uh, not too late. Uh, my name is Amanda Golub. Um, I host and produce the Near and Queer to My Heart podcast. Um, and so it, one of the reasons I wanted to put this together is because when I started doing a podcast, I realized like I need to know the legal side of it to make sure I'm protected. Um, and when I started looking into things, a lot of it overlaps with uh, blogs and then web series have some visual components. But if you do a podcast and you're trying to also add videos, you need to keep that stuff in mind too. Um, so that's you know how this came about. And um, you want to introduce yourself? Sure. So my name is Jen Grace. I um, I have two podcasts that I have had for quite some time now. Um, but I, but uh, Amanda and I have been table mates out in the mm. expo area, and I've had some copyright issues myself with my publishing company. So I have a book publishing company that focuses on nonfiction and memoir, and um, I've run into a few issues. So um, she lured me in to <laughs> share my experiences with you. Yeah, we were just you know, sharing, and I was like, you have some really good examples. It'd be better if you came here and shared them. Um, but before we get started, uh, I was hoping to go around the room um, and everyone kind of just say who you are, and if you have a podcast blog or web series or if you're looking to do one, um, and if not, that's fine. I uh, just want to kind of get the idea of you know what people are looking for answers so we can try to make sure uh, to cover everything um, that you guys are interested in. So if, would you mind getting okay. started? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm honestly. And um, I'm here because I'm working on a lot of web series content that is yet to be created. Okay. So I you know, just wanted to know the rules, if you will. All right. Uh, Dorian Block. I'm a hobby blogger and aspiring novelist. Uh, I'm Rachel Wolkowitz. I'm a lawyer. Um, I have the intern at the Copyright Office, so uh, I just. Could resist going for it. <laughs> <laughs> you might be able to help us out. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Tori Rosen, um, content producer, writer, and writer. Uh, I'm a writer and I'm Kelsey. Hi. And we have a uh, Fat Queer Positive uh, podcast called Structure Marks, and we started our second season, and we got a little bit, so we thought we should probably get on the reality side of things. <laughs> nice. Cool. I'm Linda, and I am interested in starting the podcast. All right, excellent. Yeah, so we got two more. Yeah, hi. <laughs> so I'm Anna. Um, I do actually a tech podcast uh, through my work, so it's not related, but I, I'm interested in this space, and in the space, so I just want to learn more. Just here to learn. Nice. Okay, great. Well, thank y'all. Hi, come on in. Sorry. Oh, no, no problem. Uh, we perfect actually, timing. yeah, perfect timing. We actually just finished going around the room, having everyone say uh, who they are and if they have a web series blog or podcast, um, and if they don't, like, kind of, you know, what you're looking to get out of this to try to make sure we cover whatever questions you might have. So, okay. not to put you on the spot right away. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, everyone. I don't know your names, but I'm oh. sorry. I'm sorry, Catherine. I'm from the Philippines. I do not have a web series or blog, but I am considering making a web series this year, which is one of the reasons I really want to come to this. Okay, great. Perfect. And I'm Amanda, and this is Jen, um, and we're here. And hello. We have another one. Yes. yes. All right. We are trickling in. So yeah. yeah. Trying to cover everybody Everyone's before we. Over it, same yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they had the Tito's lady was here early today, so <laughs> I think that. Uh, hi, hi. For, for folks. Okay. Okay, <laughs> great. Hi, for folks that just came in, I'm Amanda, this is Jen. Uh, we were just asking folks to introduce themselves and say if you already have a blog, uh, podcast, or web series, and if you don't, what you're looking, if you're looking to develop one, or just kind of what you're looking to get out of this. So if you guys want to do a quick intro. Um, hi, I'm Kelly. My pronouns are they, them, uh, he, him, changes. Not so much uh, she, her, him, she, him, very often. Um, so any of those go. And I actually do have a blog. It's a graduate blog right now called Learning in Las Vegas that I'm doing as part of my graduate program. And I post some personal things on there, but it's mainly graduate studies kind of stuff. Um, and it has roots in like disability justice and all that. And I just started not a web series, but it's a YouTube channel. Finally did that. And similar thing, but also connected to fandom. So 
different types of fandom, like anime, manga, certain types of Netflix series, stuff like that. Oh, great. So I'm looking to just learn more in general from all of you. Yeah. My name is Jessica, my pronouns are she, her, and I'm really just working on like novels, kind of, I'm kind of old school, I think of it in a classical sense, of, like I have to get this published, but I'd really like to learn about getting my product out there and maybe using blogs as a way to do that, or learning to protect YouTube content as well, because I have a YouTube channel and I don't have much viewers, so. <laughs> All right, great, thank you. Um, so I don't know, uh, I did have a PowerPoint uh, prepared, but um, uh, no one told me about how the technology would be hooked up, so uh, sorry that we don't have an actual uh, PowerPoint, but if so, if I'm looking at my phone, that's kind of. Um, uh, I think you can ask one of the, there's like a question on that person. Okay, that's it. I mean, we're here, so we're gonna, <laughs> but thank you. <laughs> yeah, uh, no one got back to me on, on that, so. Um, has anyone actually uh, copy like paid to copyright or, or trademark anything? You have what was? Uh, uh, it was a script. Um, both ten oh, and, and an album once, like a music album. Okay, and that was an easy experience for you. I mean, <laughs> 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 uh, fumbling around the copyright government sites and yeah. trying to figure out what's the right form is really challenging. Yeah, so for copyright, copyright's a way to protect, um, you know, any of the, the works that you have, um, and you can pay to do that, and that's an actual copyright, and the reason that you would want to pay for it is because if anybody else um, tries to uh, use something similar to take your name, you'd have the, the copyright on it, and you could actually, you know, hold that against other, other folks. You can do that with trademarks as well. Um, there is an implied copyright, which happens, and that happens the minute that something's put into an actual uh, format. So if you have a blog and then you publish the blog, there's an implied copyright to everything on there, uh, whether you pay for it or not. If you pay for it, you can protect it against other folks that are, you know, trying to, trying to do something. So that's kind of the difference. It is, like, for a script, that's absolutely, um, you, you want to do that. Um, for, you know, a podcast, the minute you publish it, um, or a web series, the minute you, you know, you put it out there, then that's when the, the copyright, the implied copyright kicks in. Um, and, for, you know, for trademark, it, you know, in order to protect a name that you have, um, you know, you would want to ap apply for that. Um, and actually, Jen, you had an example for a, a trademark issue that was interesting because Jen has her own um, publishing company, um, and she was when she was deciding on the name and deciding to uh, trademark that name to protect the name, um, something kind of came up. So yeah, can, um, does everyone know the difference between copyright and trademark? Because I was going to say oh yeah okay. Do you want to just kind of cover that quickly, and then I'll go into my example. Yeah, so the trademark, uh, that would protect like words and phrases, uh, symbols or designs identifying a source of the goods or the service. So, um, a, you know, a trademark is, is a name um, of like a company like McDonald's or um, something like that. And then a copyright is, um, you know, it's a form of intellectual property law. It protects the original work of authorship. Um, so that's most, mostly, you know, um, if you're going to have an artistic work, music, a song, an album, poetry, writing, um, computer software, architecture, all of that would fall under copyright. Good. So, <laughs> got some heads nodding. So, okay, so I have a book publishing company. It's now called Publish Your Purpose Press, but when I started it, I started off with purpose driven publishing because I work with mission driven people, purpose driven people, etc. And I did not pay any bit of attention to trademark in any way, shape, or form. And so I just started using it and everything was good. I started the company, had it going for probably like eight or nine months, I would say, and I filed for a trademark for purpose-driven publishing, only to find out that Rick Warren, the author of Purpose Driven Life, indeed holds the trademark for purpose-driven across the board. So even though in filing, when you file for a trademark, and I'm not a lawyer in any way, shape, or form, mm -hmm. uh, but when you file for trademark, there's different types of like categories or classifications that you can select. So when I had applied for it, I specifically said for non-religious works, because I know that that's kind of the, the entire basis. And my attorney was like, mm, we, we might be able to get away with it if we try this. Um, but I ended up getting like an immediate cease and desist. Like it was just a, no, this is not working. Um, and to battle somebody like like Rick Warren where his book actually I think it's either I think it's either the number two book second to the Bible I believe <laughs> or his book is sells more it's, than the Bible like yeah. it's 
So obviously he has a lot of money and I wasn't going to go down that path. But to, you know, one of the things that I think about is that if I had decided to like look into like, do I want to, like if I had looked into it first, it might have stopped me from like getting my business off the ground as fast as I got it off the ground. But I would really encourage you to make the change, like really just do it the right way. So go to the trademark database. You, um, what's the website? So if you go to USPTO.com, <laughs> you want to look at the test database, T-E-S-S, -S, and you can just do a word search there. Um, and uh, it's absolutely right, there's different, what's called classes. And so, for example, you know, books, is gonna, there are going to be a particular type of class. And you could have, um, so the classic example that is, is that you have Apple for computing, and then you have Apple for music. So the Beatles owned Apple for a very long time. And then when um, Apple computers started getting into music, then the people, people who owned the Beatles copyright, like ha had a, I'm sorry, trademark, had like a big hubbub. And they said, you know, get out of music. And they had a, Apple had to resolve that issue before going into music for exactly that mm -hmm. reason. Yeah, so you, you don't want to mess around. And the ramifications that I'm still dealing with years later are that when I, when you brand yourself, you have your logo, you have your, you know, you have your information absolutely everywhere. I have online programs and I'm still finding areas where it is it's the old the old name is still there. So like that's the type of pain in the ass that you have to look forward to if you don't do it right from the start. So it can be really costly because if I it, if I did try to actually go against him, I'm confident I would have lost, which is why I didn't even try. But in some instances you probably could end up winning the right to use it, but it's going to cost you a lot of money. So you're better off just doing your homework and research and really uh, making sure that whatever you're using, whether it's the name of a podcast or um, whether it's the name of a book, a company, it doesn't matter. You really want to do your homework. And even though the you know it's a government website it's actually I find it pretty easy to use that database <laughs> might be hard to decipher what you're looking at but there's always like a YouTube video that can help you figure it out <laughs> yeah and I think it's also important like um, in that uh, he uh, Rick Warren he tra trademarked purpose-driven not purpose-driven life so that way he left it open so that anybody that came in with purpose-driven anything mm -hmm. he could enforce against so mm -hmm. that's I mean you know, we can take what you know you've learned from this and, and apply it so if you're thinking about like what you're actually going to trademark you might want to leave it in the more generic term because that might protect against you know other folks that are trying to do something similar and that's what I ended up doing with my company now so it's publish your purpose press but publish your purpose is what's trademarked and it's now a registered trademark. So that's covered. So if I wanted to expand into any other area or someone tried to use Publish Your Purpose, I have no idea what example I would throw into there. But if I thought it was too, you know, encroaching too much on my turf, I could, I could pursue legal action. So it is better to go broad. Yeah, yeah. please. So for example, you couldn't if you had like a car dealership. Correct. So if it's, if it's far afield, again, back to that one, yeah. apple, then mm -hmm. you each can sort of coexist. But when you sort of start getting closer to each other, then, um, and that was the problem that I ran into because his purpose-driven trademark specifically covered um, works of nonfiction. So because of that specific classification that he had, in addition to dozens of others, um, that's the one that, that was the loophole for, or the, the sticking point for me. Um, and does anybody who um, currently has a web series uh, blog or podcast, does anyone use or put out copyrighted material? Like, do you have on your blog, like, a picture of someone from a movie or, um, you know, play a clip on your podcast of a song that it, you don't own the rights to? Um, so that's, you know, that could be a form of copyright infringement. Um, and it, it's a very, it's kind of, a, and there are certain exceptions to that, and we'll, we'll go over those. But basically, I think the best rule is ask permission to use it um, before you use it. And then if not, the best policy would be not to use any copyrighted material um, unless it falls into some of the exceptions. Uh, you just want to be safe in case somebody who owns that will, you know, will come after you um, and threaten to sue or actually, you know, sue you on that. Um, because I know, uh, you know a lot of people do that. Like for our podcast, um, we have the logo. We commissioned a, a local artist to make it. And then we paid her for it and paid her for the rights to use it forever. So she designed it, and she got money for designing it, and then that's it. So she can't use it in any of her stuff unless I give her permission to. Um, and then our theme song, my brother wrote it. And even though he's my brother, I made sure to get written permission um, that, you know, that he's giving me the song and that I own the song and the rights to it. Um, I think that's, you know, that stuff's important um, when it comes to copywriting. There are um, some exceptions to that. 
um, if anything's in the public domain, uh, then you're free to use it. Um, even if it had a copyright at one point, it no longer has a copyright on it. Um, there is uh, some, um, anything that <coughs> is a US government work. I don't, I don't know exactly what you work on, but if it's, you're nodding your head. It's a great resource. Yeah. Oh, no, no, I'm happy. I'm so happy you're here because <laughs> you have like a lot of specific information and personal, probably some personal firsthand stories to share with us. So we're happy for you to, you know, contribute anything. Uh, but I think you're exactly right. So, federal, so I would also just point out that state government's different, but federal government, and think about all the things the government puts out, NIH, USDA, like anything for nature, you can get off, you know, NASA, there's tons of graphics, there's tons of images. So um, I would definitely sort of go there as a resource if you want to use sort of uh, pictures or something, um, because there's a very good chance that if it's on a government website, you can, you can grab it and you can sort of transform it without that risk that you were just talking about. Yeah. Um, and so that's, you know, an, one of the exceptions to, to copyright. Um, fair use is kind of the most common one that, that you're going to see. Um, and that's when you're using brief excerpts of copyrighted material under certain cir circumstances. Um, you definitely need to give credit to whoever you are getting anything from. You absolutely need to give credit so that nobody would assume it's yours. Um, that's how a lot of YouTube videos get shut down. They'll include clips from movies or songs that are not theirs, and they don't credit it. And they'll, or sometimes they'll play the whole thing. And that's, you know, you can't play the whole thing. <laughs> Um, you know, but if you use a clip, you got to be careful about that. Like I said, best thing to do is to ask permission um, if you can and, and get that in writing somewhere. Um, and then if not, just be very careful about how you use it. Um, can I chime in for something? Yes, absolutely. Um, in thinking about this, you want to have all of your I's dotted and the T's crossed. Because so from a, a publishing standpoint for books, so going back to kind of public domain, Right now, like Google, Amazon, everybody has like, there's bots. There's just bots who are the ones that are kind of like scanning to see like if you're, you know, infringing on something or not. And they do not, they shut things down, then they ask questions later. So you don't want to get caught in that scenario. And we had one author's book. It's um, kind of the intersection between race and trauma and how that kind of plays out in people's lives. And we were using what we believed was a part of the public domain, which was a uh, letter about slavery from like the 1700s. And Amazon shut our entire account down, did not, like we had like nothing that we could do about it while the book was launching. So all of a sudden her account was just completely shut down and it was me on the phone screaming at Amazon because it was a bot who had gone through and just flagged it because we had used too much of the letter itself even though we genuinely thought we were you know, not infringing on anything. So we had to go back, re-edit that whole page and then republish it. But we had to do this in a matter of like hours. Um, and Amazon, I mean, um, yeah, Amazon just, they, they don't care because it's Amazon and they can do whatever they please. So so, and it's the same thing with Google, YouTube, like everything. So it's just better to have all that documentation in order and know that you're in the right. So if they do shut you down, you have the right kind of recourse that you can go and get your account back online. So can I ask a question specific to that? Is there some, like, how would you have known? Because you were presuming it was in the public domain. Like, how would you have known or could have checked in a, in a situation like that? How would one do that? Yeah, that's a good question. Do you have an answer for that? <laughs> in, in general, um, things are, in general, written works post-1923, um, I believe, or 1924, um, I think it just came the year, um, are in the public domain. There are, uh, I, honestly, the best resources to um, the university that, if you go to copyright.gov, um, you can get pointed to resources where they're sort of trying to explain because one of the things about copyright is that as you get to different art forms, the rules can change a little. So music is a perfect example. Um, nothing in the music copyright world makes any logical sense. Um, it really is sort of like layers of paint that sort of like were splashed onto each other, and so it's created a big, a big giant mess. Um, and there's also, uh, prior to 1978, um, it, your copyright didn't sort of spring like it does now. Now, as you said, it sort of you put it in fixed medium. Copyright sort of springs um, from that fixation. But prior to 1978, it needed actually a copyright um, logo on it, a particular notice. And so you have things like um, everyone's you know favorites, like it's a wonderful life. Why is it's a wonderful life so popular? Well, it's because it's in the public domain, and so it could be play on NBC every Christmas for the last 50 years. 
Um, so anyway, so back to the <laughs> um, it, there, it's hard to say, but typically if it's super duper old and the artist is over 100 years, you're probably in very good shape. Um, but there are sort of corner cases. And for example, translations can also snare people a lot. Mm -hmm. Because for example, Sappho, she's super dead, right? <laughs> <laughs> but modern translations are, are sort of have that copyright attached to it. And so you sort of, um, one of the artists here in the vendor area, we were talking with her, uh, with, with that the artist, um, that the artist had to be very careful about what translations they were using um, because the translations had still had copyright and could have run into issues, even though the poetry itself was thousands of years old. Yeah, so in my case, like, you know, something that's, it may have been the 1800s, not 17, excuse me. Um, but still, in theory, it should have been part of the public domain. And honestly, it very well might be. It was just because Amazon had a robot that was flagging things, and we didn't have time to deal with the bureaucracy. It was easier for us to just swap it out for something different. Um, so, but you know, in those instances, again, it, you're better to try to do your homework. And having a good IP attorney on uh, handy, which mm -hmm. we have a couple in the in the room, um, that can really be a life. Saber. You're an IP attorney? A little bit. Okay, a little bit. Yeah, I was like, she's pointing at you. <laughs> um, do you have anything to add to anything we've talked about so far? Or is it so far, cover? Yeah, okay. Because <laughs> <laughs> I was like, you might have some personal stories or some insight um, that, you know, we don't we don't have up here. Um, another, another thing um, that would be kind of, you know, an exception to the copyright issues, is there something called, not really an exception, but something you can use um, if you're looking for music, um, if you're looking for art, there's something called Creative Commons, which are artists um, that will allow you to use their whatever they have, um, and all they want is credit for it. So it's a way for artists to get their work out there, and it's just, I think it's Creative Commons, is it .com? It's just, you can just look it up. Um, some will only give you a non-commercial license. Yeah. Yeah, that's a whole other can of worms, um, especially when it comes to, to books. So you might be able to use an image on your website, but you can't use it in a printed material in a book. So that might be applicable to you working on a novel. Yeah, but each one will lay it out, you know, specifically yeah. on the website. But that's a good resource if you're like, I need a theme song for my podcast, and I don't write music, and I don't know where to get that, um, you know. So that that's a way to get that, and that's a way for artists also to be able to get their works out there and on their own terms. So they they'll specifically say, um, you know, what what type of licensing that they're uh, looking to do, and as long as you respect that, you'll be able to access that. So that's you know kind of something that might be helpful. I use Ben Sound, it's B-E-N Sound, for a lot of the music that I use in my YouTube videos and on my podcast, which is all part of the Creative Commons. Yeah, um, and then as far as web series or any sort of visual media, I think, um, you know, one thing that, that's come up is uh, the use of brand names. Like, if you are filming a scene and somebody is drinking a Diet Coke, is that okay to use um, and the the answer is uh, it's safer not to um, and not to go into that but most likely it's okay you can use the thing for the thing it's intended to be for so if you have a Diet Coke and someone's drinking a Diet Coke that's okay if you use the Diet Coke as a bomb or something that it's not meant to to be used for um, then that that could cross the line on that um, so you just want to think about, and I know it's hard, but we're all on very limited budgets <laughs> trying to do things. We don't think about, um, you know, every thing in the room. Is this an Ikea chair? Is that, does it say McDonald's on it? Whatever it is. So it's just, you know, uh, something to keep in mind in that. Yeah. And, and that applies to, like, published written works as well, like, when you reference. Like, you, you just don't want to reference any, like, brand yeah, that's, yeah, there's a lot of kind of nuance to that. As long as you're sourcing and citing people properly, so if you're using APA style or Chicago style, whatever the, the style um, that you're using, as long as you're properly sourcing and citing, you are usually in good shape. And after doing, um, you know, dozens of books at this point, that has not been an issue, knock on wood. Um, and yeah, and our authors are all nonfiction, so they're always sourcing other people's materials. So you should be okay. But I'm not a lawyer. That's my <laughs> disclaimer. Yeah, and then another thing, um, and I, I think it applies to all blog 
blogs, podcasts, and um, web series is if you have guests, if you have actors, if you have anybody working on the show, I would highly recommend having them sign something in writing that they're agreeing to give you their image or their interview or uh, for you to be able to use that in your blog post. Um, if you're recording, sometimes with the podcast, I try, I have a form. Every once in a while, I forget the form that I have. Um, and I'm happy afterwards uh, to, if you want to give me your information, I can just email you the form that I use for my podcast. But every once in a while, I forget it. I, I can get it in recording verbally to have them confirm that this is what they're here for and they're agreeing to do this and that you know I can I can use um, you know the interview that we have um, verbal's fine and hopefully nothing you know I've never had any issues all of my guests have been happy to they, they agreed to do it in the first place but every once in a while someone will hear you know a podcast back and be like oh I didn't mean that you know and they might get upset by that so you want to make sure that you have that permission up front um, also if you're recording in a public space you can just make signs that just say like recording is happening by entering the space you you know agree to be um, on camera um, and be recorded so because um, I, I uh, do stand up also and so sometimes we do like live recordings of our stand ups so we want to have those signs up there because you don't want an audience member say I didn't know I was being recorded and then you wouldn't be able to put your special out or your recording out and that could be problematic um, so that's just, you know, as far as permissions, you want to keep, like I said, even if it's your brother, even if it's your best friend, you don't know what's going to happen uh, down the road. So you just want to be really careful um, about that and just to protect yourself. Everything about this is like, hopefully none of this is going to happen down the road, but if it does, you have um, everything that you need to have. Did you? I'm sorry. Stop me if this is not relevant, but um, I... Uh, so I, I feel like it's like a more gray area for like published works. Like I heard Pat Conroy, he would use like actual conversations like that he had. He's like, that's going in my next book. And like, you know, so in those kinds of contexts, like it's not like everybody you talk to, you're gonna be like, by the way, I'm a writer. And so everything you do might be an inspiration for me. But like the, the disclaimer that you have, like this is a work of fiction, if that's enough to cover your back. You know, I was actually sitting at my table this morning reading a lot of different articles about memoirs and the legalities of them. So we publish memoirs as well. And so in the front of every book that we publish, it very clearly has like a, you know, names, places, whatever's have been changed to essentially protect the innocent. Um, and there's some famous quote that's like, if you don't want to be written poorly in someone's memoir, then maybe you should have treated them better. Um, <laughs> but at the same time, you still have to worry about libel, slander, all of the stuff that goes with that. So, you know, someone might off the cuff say, oh yeah, I'm using this in my book, but the chances are they probably aren't going to use it in the exact way that 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 kind of transpired. Um, so you want to make sure that you are separating yourself from the likeness or separating kind of what you're writing away from the likeness of that individual person. And I'm working on my own memoir right now, which is why I'm trying to like figure out the legality so I don't have like certain people in my life coming after me as a result of publishing <laughs> it. Um, and I'm trying to like remove it as much as possible. And there's a lot of kind of um, just thought around like you don't have to say that someone's an asshole, but you can kind of paint the picture and let the reader draw the conclusion like this person's an asshole without actually saying it. And that, from what I understand, you're in, you're in um, better shape. But always change names, places, certain things that would be very obvious like, oh, that's, that's so-and-so's sister. Like you wanna make sure that it's um, far enough removed. And I was l reading some case study and I don't remember which actress it was, but someone who very clearly, oh, uh, Lena Dunham. She, like, whatever, some person that she was writing about with her sexual assault, she s described the person as having cowboy boots and, uh, like, a cowboy hat at the campus that she was at, and everybody knew who she was talking about. Uh -huh. So it's, like, something as simple as that, like, mm -hmm. you know, if someone's known for wearing cowboy boots and a hat, like, pick a different thing. Like, right. make it motorcycle boots and, like, a leather jacket. Like, just something that it wouldn't be so obvious, like, oh, that's that person. Definitely. Yeah, this is very nuanced. Yeah, and everything's going to be different on a case-to-case -case basis. Um, so we're just trying to get the general. I mean, I some people lean more towards um, you know ask for forgiveness later <laughs> um, kind of mentality with that. Uh, I'm on the safer side of if I don't have permission to do it, I'm not going to touch it. Um, I think a lot of times most things are are safe. It's just, and I think honestly, if you're not monetizing at this point, it's less of a risk. But 
hopefully, or I don't know what everyone's planning on doing, but a lot of people are planning to eventually monetize. And the minute that you're ha you have ads on your podcast or um, any anyone's paying you to do it, then you're now commercial. And then that, you know, we'll, we'll have a whole different, it, it'll be, people will come after you a lot <laughs> uh, more than if it's just something for personal use. Um, does anyone have any other questions? Yeah. I have a question about, um if you have any suggestions for beta readers, like mm -hmm. the little thing to have them sign. Um, yes. So, so that they don't steal. A non-disclosure agreement. Yes. Have it just, it, it doesn't have to be super crazy and you can, there's a lot of reasons why you'd want to new, use a non-disclosure just in business in general. Um, but yeah, just, and I actually sent yesterday morning, I was sending my, my manuscript out to beta readers um, and I did not do that. And so, you know, one would, one would assume that I would know better. Um, but yeah, just a simple non-disclosure. And that basically says that anything that they're, you know, that they're reading, that they're not going to go do anything with. And if they do something with it, you have some kind of legal recourse that you can take as a result of that. Um, so yeah, and you can get templates on like yeah, go to like Legal Zoom or, and if you want my card, I'll happily send you ours. You can just modify it. But I'm, again, not taking um, legal. I'm, I'm legal disclaimer. Not a lawyer. <laughs> I'm just gonna keep saying that. Yeah. I know we're being recorded. <laughs> <laughs> and were there any other tips that you wanted to to share? Just personal experiences that you've had uh, dealing with uh, you know different copyright or trademark issues. Well, I think I'm, I was telling you about my podcast yesterday yeah. or this morning. Um, yeah, the music. Yeah, right? yeah. So I grabbed like a five-second piece of a vitamin C song from like the early 2000s for my first podcast. Um, that's called, I think it's Personal Branding for the LGBTQ Professional. I think is the name of it, which I should know, but it's in <laughs> um, And I grabbed just that like that simple like snippet of it, and then who knows how many episodes I had already published when I was like, oh shit, like I can't do that. And that's when I switched over to using Ben Sound, where as long as you're giving them some kind of credit somewhere in your, wherever it is, then um, you're in better shape. So don't go trying to, you know, scrub someone else's data or, you know, even if it's only five seconds, it's still their work and um, it's part of, you know, their, especially that, it's gonna be copywritten. Yeah, and a lot of people think, oh, it's a short clip. It's you know a 30-second clip of a two-hour movie, but there can still be problems with it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, even a five-second clip. Mm -hmm. So, just take no chances. <laughs> like we've already we've done the screw-ups for you, so you don't have to. <laughs> um, so, how does that trade off with the fair use exception to those copyright claims? Like, if you use that five-second clip, like when when is it fair use and when is it not? I don't know that that would ever be fair use. So, okay. So, what, what is the... I don't know. Again, it's not my area of expertise. Yeah. Okay. So, um, fair use is a court-driven, four-factor, very complicated test that is a lot in the eye of the beholder of the judge. <laughs> Yeah, I, start, I started writing it out, and then I was like, that might be too, that might be its whole own <laughs> presentation, it, 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 so... Yeah, it's um, like a whole white course in law school. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so, so it's, it's, it, it, the key is though it, that it, it could be in the eye of the beholder, which is why caution makes sense. Yeah, that's pretty. I mean, a lot of times what happens in these cases, like, um, I think a good example is uh, Robin Thicke and, um, is it, uh, it, Blurred yeah, Blurred Lines song, and then Marvin Gaye's family. It's basically the judge listened to it and kind of, there's a there's different um, things that the judge can look for, like how many notes are in common and whatever, but it's ultimately a judge is kind of, I think in that case, like the judge just listened to it and was like, oh, they sound similar. Um, and uh, oftentimes, you know, uh, these things have to end up before a judge, but what they don't tell you is that that's, you know, they all have lawyers to deal with that stuff they all have money to deal with that stuff uh, we're trying to talk with folks on the front end because you know uh, like, like Jen said if you know uh, someone who has a team of lawyers tells you you know not to do something then you're you shouldn't do it because um, you know if they're right but even if they're not like it's still gonna be an uphill battle for you like Jen said like there, she could have fought it and maybe at the end of that road had you know six figures of lawyer bills and been able to use this name but in the meantime she could just rebrand and um, you know actually get her uh, company out there um, versus dealing with these legal battles and that's the, unfortunately the the problem with a lot of this stuff is people who have money uh, can kind of be the bullies and I really hate that and I hope it changes <laughs> um, in the future but uh, you'll see that too I, I think like songs like Coldplay 
Coldplay had a song. Um, uh, I forget what's the song, but they had a song that uh, Chris Martin was seen at a concert for another band who had a very similar song. And then a year later, he put out this song, and it's you know it, it goes to the courts because that band contacts Coldplay and they're like, hey, you stole our stuff. And Coldplay says, no, we didn't. And then that band had to sue them um, in order, and then get a judge to decide. Um, and the judges, like I said, they look on, and we can, I don't want to get too much into the legal stuff, but they'll look at certain uh, prongs to decide. But it's ultimately, I do feel like there is some personal, like, did they hear it, did they not kind of thing. And, you know, the commonality <laughs> probably in this room is that we're all at s somehow in the LGBTQ community or somehow tied to it. So I personally would not want to be risking anything at the hands of some random judge um, if, our, if your content has any queer related focus. So I feel like that's just a safer, a safer bet. Yeah. Um, and does anyone have any other questions or just cool stories you want to share or, and not cool stories, but experiences that you've learned from? Someone's got a question. <laughs> Come on, even the shy folks. Yeah. Um, well, the book that I'm writing, um, it's like I, I use a lot of song title names, but I had asked a publisher that I knew, um, like, is it okay to just say this is a song title by this person, and like that would be enough to credit that? And like it was, it was this was the um, record label that put it out, put that information in the book, but other than that, that's it? Like, you, and maybe, sh or should I ask for every single song, is it okay if I include this title name? No lyrics, nothing else, but yeah. I think the song titles, I, I do know an author who's actually here um, who has a, a trilogy of books and she does a, no lyrics, um, but the song titles were, you know, okay. okay. And she had, uh, I, I have a family friend who's a lawyer, check that out. So that was, um, I think once you start quoting the lyrics, that's when um, it can it can get a little dicey. Billy Joel, Billy Joel. Yeah, the Charlie <laughs> Allen trilogy. Yeah, we bought her trilogy for, yeah, for our niece. Oh yeah, they're great, they're great books. I actually, I, uh, she, I actually interviewed her for the, the yeah, the podcast. And yeah, so it's Burn Before Reading, um, I forgot the second book, and then the third book's Burn After Reading. So it, she had, and then her, the character listens to records all the time and music's a big focus in, in the character's life. So it's uh, figuring out like where that line is. So she kind of did, did a deep dive on that. And she's, uh, probably still here exhibiting if you want to talk to her more about about that exact issue. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And well, I, I would just also jump in and say that some people are more litigious than other people. So like, for example, I would not do that with a Bob Dylan because okay. he is extraordinarily litigious. Okay. And like maybe look up what their tendencies are. Yeah, like I would just do a, yeah, a quick Google search might save you again a lot of grief um, because um, one of the things about copyright that distinguishes it from trademark is that um, copyright, uh, trademark, you, you're, you have to keep your trademark because it's a, a commerce right. You have to you go, go out and defend it. So people are, tend to have sort of sharper elbows around trademark because it's sort of a use or lose thing. Whereas copyright, um, they can be sort of, which also makes it a little more fraught, is that they can be sort of, you know, use my stuff, and then when I get pissed off, I'm going to sue. Yeah. Um, which means that it could be that there you can do a, a few more things with it, um, but um, with this, but it could mean that you know they also could be very litigious and then sort of like hit you with a hammer all the time. So just I you know, just it, yeah, like burger. Burger King's been very litigious in the past, and anyone that has Burger and, and King or any sort of you know, similar thing, they have come after them hard. And whether, like I said, whether they're right or wrong, um, they have the resources to come after you in a way that you don't have the resources, probably. Maybe you do, <laughs> uh, to, to respond to that. Um, but there's a lot of cases. There's certain companies that will actually just be ready, looking out for anything that comes up with their keywords, and they're ready to go, and they'll send you a cease and desist, and if you try to fight it, they will come after you. So That's it's just... <laughs> yeah, they had a um, when they were first coming up, and there was. Like, how he was like, basically, it was the name. Yeah. The name was really good. Yeah. <laughs> I had.
had an author who was trying to use song lyrics, and we just shut that down. We're like, no, you can't. Yeah, it's just. Like I, I don't want to use a single song lyric. It's just the name. But. Yeah, yeah. He wanted to like start every chapter with like some meaningful song lyric, and it, it would have made sense, but it did not seem worth the risk potentially. So the alternative with song titles is like just look up the litigious like litigious nature of those artists like i mean no no guarantees yeah, yeah. Yes. <laughs> it's like, but it's a safer it's a safer bet than quoting lyrics and there's a lot of um like startup hubs and communities i don't know what area you're in but if you go to like any startup place a lot of them have like office hours for business attorneys accountants you know different types of um, functionality so if you kind of look to see what's in your area yeah. you might be able to have a sit down conversation with a lawyer that can specifically advise you and there's also an organization called score and they have a mentorship program and all sorts of free resources so you can check them out too because i know they have lawyers there as well there, i think yeah, is it the Ella Project? There's another group that if, you, if your work has been taken, um, there's a New Orleans uh, stand-up comedian who um, they, they had this, um, I don't know, they had this thing, they're like, come on down and um, we're, we're giving away money. And they, she showed up and they gave her $500 and she signed a waiver and then they, they used that as part of a Super Bowl commercial. <laughs> And she had no idea she was going to be in a commercial, and she had no idea she was going to be, you know, in a Super Bowl commercial, which is like the biggest commercial you could be on. Um, and so, and but she doesn't have any money besides that $500 uh, that she got to really come after them. But she found, I think it's called the Ella Project, and um, they will help people who haven't gotten compensation. So if you uh, put your book out there and somebody quotes it or tries to make a movie out of it or does something with that, um, you might, you know, need to seek their help to to protect that. Um, yeah. You want to always read the fine print before signing anything. I know we're yeah. all kind of like in that habit of like, oh, it's some legal bullshit. Let me just sign my name. Um, that's where she obviously signed something clearly yeah. that gave expressed written permission for them to use her likeness in a Super Bowl commercial. And it was probably right there, right in the in the document. But most people don't read it. And that's what people, um, you know, that's what they're they're just hoping that you're not going to read it. Yeah, and that's another thing I like to do with my podcast guests is I'll have them sign the waiver, and then when we get on, when I'm doing sound check, when I'm getting the you know room sound, I'll read it over with them. Mm -hmm. um, so I also have the verbal like this is what this says. You know, you understand? Do you have any questions? So that you know, also just in case, and hopefully everybody's cool with like the interviews that they agreed to do in the first place. But in case later on they come back and they're like, I didn't agree to do that, and you recorded me secret, or whatever they might try to say, that I could be like, not only did you sign this written paper, but verbally you went over it um, and you understand everything and we have that on recording so it's always helpful just to protect yourself because you don't know and uh, it's the thing like you hope everybody's good and cool and does what they say they're going to do but uh, I'm sure <laughs> the lawyer knows that's not always the case and that's why you have a job that you do this I'm sure. <laughs> Um, I mean, I think other than just the being sure of what brands are are on there, um, you know, that that I think is the the biggest uh, you know difference is like you have to really be aware of you know what's in this room right now. Like if um, you know we were recording uh, and if someone else was recording not Clexicon and this has Clexicon on here um, and we're at the Tropicana and do we have permission to record and do we have permission to be in this space and that could be problematic if we were just filming a movie and Tropicana is like we did not give you permission to go in a, a room and film this um, you know that that could be problematic so. Um, like I said, just, you know, ask, and you'd be surprised if you ask somebody that you, like an artist that you're very fond of, and you're like, hey, I want to use this in my podcast, they might just write back and say yes. I mean, you, you never know. Um, so it's just good to at least ask that permission first. It translates to written work as well. So for us, when we're putting any images, we always have a permission from whoever is the creator of that image. And if you can't get their permission, you have to recreate the image yourself. But even then, you have to make sure that it's not exactly identical to whatever that might be. And we've run into a number of snags around this type of issue that most of the time, if you can't get permission from whoever created it, it's just better to leave it out. Do you have a question? Exactly. Yeah. For the first, going back to the discussion on trademarks, what about things like parodies? You know, like if you paradise, if you paradise a trademark, is that fine or not? Okay. 
I was like, you, you started laughing. <laughs> Uh, unfortunately, and um, I'm, it's, it probably depends on what your client should have done in the first place. Um, so, uh, um, yeah, I'm just going to say it's like a case by case basis um, because, um, and it also matters what the trademark is. So, um, bigger, more famous, tra so like the Burger King probably is going to have, because it's so big and famous, will probably have sort of a bigger right attached to it. Um, than uh, a um, probably a smaller a trademark, so it's um, probably just want to do an analysis. And um, similarly in copyright, there's a little more freedom, I would say. I don't know. I'm looking at the other lawyer too. Uh, <laughs> a little more freedom, um, but you also sort of run into the eye of the beholder problem, mm -hmm. where you can get a judge that if they think you're funny, you're like, yes, so mm -hmm. fair use. And if they think you're not funny, not fair use. Um, so it, it can sort of be problematic like that as well. Mm -hmm. Going back to my point, you don't want to take your chances with a, a, with a judge. Right. Just yeah, play it safe. Yeah, like McDonald's, anything with Mick in front of it that has to do with food or fast food or anything related to them toy, like they'll fu they'll shut it down. Um, so even if you're making, if you're like Mick bad food, like the then you're you know thinking that I don't know, I'm not. This is off the cuff, but like, um, <laughs> but anything like that, they they would probably you know come after you because they that would be a parody, but it would hurt them, um, and I, I think they would come after you for that. <laughs> There's a whole business, and you could probably speak to this more since it's your actual area. I just happened to like read up on it, um, where it, it's just trolls who are like specifically waiting for you to infringe on their trademark or their copyright, and they are going to do everything they can to get every dime out of you, and they just keep doing it over. And if you look into it, it's it's horrifying, um, and they prey on people that they know are going to back down, and they they know they're gonna they're gonna win. So it might be just like, oh, you know, pay us five hundred dollars, we'll leave you alone, or pay us five thousand dollars, and we'll leave you alone, even if you may or may not be in the wrong. It's that legal, like, you know, it's that um, just the fear of like, oh shit, like, what, what else could I be? Um, you know, what else might I owe? And I've just seen so many people get screwed over by it. Um, there's a lot of podcasts that actually talk about it too. It's it's a little bit scary. So you just don't want to get on any trolls' radar. And for the second one, is more about music. I, I did try to read up about this, and you know, as you mentioned, if it's older music, for example, let's say Tchaikovsky, then you you do. The, the, um, the pages, the, sh the sheet music, the music sheets are in public domain. But again, going back to the recording, if it's a recent recording, you cannot use that. If it's a recording prior to certain years, then you might be able to use that. But uh, for example, for current music, it, it, uh, based on what I understand, it's like you have to write the publisher, you have to write the artist, you have, it's like, this, this, I mean, like, there's like so many different people you have to contact. Is that correct? Yeah, kind of. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so just don't whoever owns the rights to it because yeah. the artists sometimes don't own the rights to their music if you know they didn't write it um, so they might not actually hold that and a lot of artists unfortunately get screwed over by that um, where they did the recording and it's something that's uh, you know out there in their public persona but they don't own the rights to it because somebody had them sign papers that they didn't read or didn't talk to a lawyer about um, so it's whoever you know owns that uh, recording specifically um, but yeah if it is like that is music that you know, like Chopin is like music that is in the public domain, but those certain recordings might not be in the public domain. So you gotta, you know, you have to do your research. Um, if you have, you know, money and, or resources to talk to an IP attorney, um, that'd be the safest, you know, the safest bet. But it, if not, then I would just err on the side of caution. Mm -hmm. I think that's just the, been the main lesson here. Is just mm -hmm. you know, We're not be to scare you to death. No, <laughs> yeah, because but we also don't want you to get sued. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one thing I would say is that I mean, any work that you guys are doing, you're investing your time, your energy, and costs and funds and stuff, and you don't want to get to a situation where you've done all that and then just the ground comes out from under you, like you, you know, mm -hmm. what, like what happened. You don't want to have that happen. And depending on where you are, um, like in New York, we have uh, volunteer lawyers for the arts, and so it's like a one-off. So if you like, there's a lot of ways if you guys are just starting out, not too established or whatever, to get free advice. Mm -hmm where someone could give you like some one-off advice on different things. In whatever state you're in, you can try to see if they have something similar, um, or see if any of the ones in New York are barred somewhere, are able to practice law in another area. 
Um, and if you are like more established or doing something more on a regular basis, then yes, definitely retain counsel because you're going to want to have, you're going to want to develop a relationship early on with somebody. It doesn't have to cost you a lot of money. There are a lot of lawyers who will do a, a, like just a one-off free consultation to kind of see if it's A, a good fit, if they're qualified to help you. So just like you shop around your projects, you should shop around the people who are helping you, whether it be your agent, your manager, your attorney, whatever. But if you want to just do like a one-off thing, there are a lot of volunteer lawyers that will pro bono do things for you. Mm -hmm. And in that, for that initial call, a lot of times you can kind of get, get to the bottom of what you're trying to figure out just by asking them simple questions. I, I find that there's a lot of, especially IP attorneys, that are very generous with their knowledge, um, even in that first call to see if you could potentially work together. Thank you very much. Hmm. All right. If uh, does anyone have any other questions? All right. What's the process of a trademark? It's just um, and also, is it uh, cost anything? Is there different cost tiers or anything like that? I found it to be a pain in the ass. <laughs> um, <laughs> and it does cost money. Um, I don't remember the exact amount. I feel like it was like four hundred. Yeah, I feel like you probably know this. It's like four hundred dollars or something like that. I thought. I don't know the cost. Um, um, but yes, there is a cost to registering a trademark with the federal government, and then you, any lawyer who you actually want to work with would want to do a, a search related to that mark to make sure you're not going to run up against um, any existing marks, and that um, will most likely cost several hundred dollars. Yeah, I ended up spending almost, I think it was just shy of $2,000 for, for my, um, to get mine trademarked. But that's because I didn't want the hassle of trying to do it myself. But I, I think it was somewhere around four hundred dollars that, that was the fee. But you don't want to submit it and then have it rejected and then have to go back and do it again. So that's why having some kind of counsel could be helpful, even if it is you know free wherever you can get it. And, and not to be so self-serving, but there are also like trademark mills that will like say that they'll register, they'll clear and register a trademark for something like five hundred dollars, and you don't want to use that lawyer. That's not enough money to do a thorough search. Mm -hmm. You want to, I would say you want to spend at least $1,000 because they're going to contact a company and have them do a proper search and it will just save you time and money and they'll want to do a proper application and then work with you in case things come up and it just, it takes time. And on a similar kind of note, so, you know, once you do get your trademark, you'll get, you know, the very pretty thing with the seal on it that's like, you know, you can now use the R in the circle, and it's like, yay. But <laughs> after that, all of, like, I get them all the time where it's these weird solicitations that say, oh, for $200, you can protect your trademark with this, this, and this. And I get them probably once every other week or so. And it's all bullshit. You don't need to do anything with it. But they, again, there's these companies that prey on people who don't know any better so you get it and it looks official it looks legit and you're like holy shit I owe these people money for for whatever this is and you don't like once you have the seal you are good to go everything else can go in the garbage yes uh, I have another trademark question so I'm a singer and my artist name is Rosie in all caps so I had another artist manager um, and this artist has the exact same name, like Rosie and all caps. I had him reach out to me and he said, um, like, I would advise you to change your name because we are going to trademark that name and then you won't be able to have it anymore. Is that legit or is he just trying to scare me? I think it's legit, but I'd ask the attorneys in the room. <laughs> Not legal advice. <laughs> but, yes. um, I would say it, it, it could be legit, but I would also say that um, all trademarks that have to be quote unquote published mm -hmm. before they're actually registered. And so if you, I don't know, set up a Google search or something <laughs> and um, see when this mark is quote unquote published, you should oppose. Mm -hmm. And that was it. And be like, no, I've been using it in commerce for X number of years if you want to continue to use it. Mm -hmm. And then at least make them, at least make them work harder than sending you a letter and scaring them off. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, set up a Google alert. That's a great idea. It takes like two seconds to do. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So just put that that is me. Like just in go into like if you go into Google and just type in Google alerts or whatever. Like it, it, you can put in like I would put it in quotations to so put in. And I, this might be because Rosie. I feel like that's you'll have thousands of alerts daily, so that's probably not helpful. Um, you can do something like Rosie trademark publication. Mm -hmm. That might be enough. Yeah, a couple of variations of that, yeah. I mean, it could be the case that it will still be registered and so you wouldn't be able to use it, mm -hmm. but that, but 
um, I don't know, just based on the story, I feel like you should make them work for it at least. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, why not? Because okay. you don't know if they actually did file it or they're just telling you they're going to file yeah. it. I don't know um, if they're going to. I yeah. think it was a, like a smaller artist too, like an independent artist like me, and he was like, oh, we're going to do this. Mm -hmm. I'm like, well, I've been using it for a long time. Like, I And if you've been using you it longer, together. then you you do have a leg to stand on. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So if you've made any money off of it, again, not legal advice, like that. But, um, like, it, he's just saying that to you. It's like, who gets the office first? Who files it? Like, race to the finish. You know? right. Like, you can... He might be saying that maybe he doesn't have the money together to do it, and you know you jump the gun on him. And so if I trademark it first, mm -hmm. yeah, you're then sure he could be able to trademark yeah. it. Yeah. yeah, okay. He might try to fight you, and but some of them <laughs> already have the trademark on both of you. <laughs> <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I'll just repeat the website USPTO.gov, and it's the test database T E S S. So it's you know if you do something like Rosie, and then look at the music classes mm -hmm. that might. I mean, it'll probably come up with a lot of results, but that could at least give you sort of, so you know the feel. Right. Because if there's six artists, then there's something called dilution, which means that you all get to live happily ever after <laughs> together. Beautiful. And who's ready to And it's not just Everything's exclusive. Rusty. Everything mm -hmm. is rusty. Everything is rusty. Everything is And then, so um, just be aware of that as well. Great. Okay. So grab four friends, get them all be rosies, and you get them all be rosies. Okay. <laughs> you all thank you guys. We have five minutes. Any last questions? Is it hard to get a copyright or a trademark? I think tra trademark. trademark. It exists as soon as you make something. Oh, right, like the. That's the implied, the, yeah. The implied you can, you can pay to get an actual. You can register, yeah. Yeah. You register in your copyright means that you get a presumption if you go into court that um, your copyright is valid. Which is very useful. Yeah, and copyright's cheaper, um, and it, it is easier to get. Um, and I, I and it depends on like what your work is and what you're doing. Um, but you know, I do think it's a good investment. Depending, um, was it like fifty five dollars? I think it depends on the type. Of yeah, and then there's if yeah, if it's like a serialized work, like a web series, you have to pay for um, a little more. I think that's fifty five, and then it's like thirty five for. I want to say I just looked it up, and I can't I remember the numbers. Yeah. yeah um, but it's it's much cheaper, and you don't need an attorney um, in the way that you do for a trademark. Yeah. All right. Well, thank y'all. Thank you. Thank you, our attorney. Not attorney is not giving legal advice. Thank you guys uh, for for being here, and thank you guys all for showing up. And hope you enjoy the last bit of the convention.